Thank you. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Tahina Ranananjo, I'm from Microsoft Research, and it's my pleasure to introduce today three great talks on verification uh, for this session, starting with the Jonathan, my colleague Jonathan Protenko, um, who will present you about uh, how to turn um, modular high-level uh, programs into, uh, verifi um, into verified uh, low-level efficient code. Thank you, and uh, go ahead. Thanks, Tahina, for the introduction. I'm live, everyone can hear me. And yes, uh, sorry, one, one second. Please ask questions also on the, um, on the Discord thread. Sorry about that. Oh, all right. Uh, thanks for attending this talk. Uh, this is joint work with my uh, awesome collaborators at uh, Enria uh, in Paris. So that's a lot of big words, uh, modularity, code specialization, zero cost abstractions. But really, this uh, talk is the story of how we landed a pretty significant amount of verified code into the reference implementation of the Python programming language. And so starting in October, if you're using Python and specifically Python 3.12, you will be enjoying a verified cryptography specifically for the hashing library that is part of the Python uh, repository. So this talk is um, the story of uh, how we built a series of high-level APIs that uh, allowed us to be very productive and save on uh, a whole lot of work and uh, make us very productive in producing that code that went into Python. And so uh, the technical ingredients that went into that are terms that should be very familiar to this audience. Uh, there's elaborator reflection, there's uh, metaprogramming, there's automated code rewriting, and there's uh, high-level abstractions. And to the right is the series of PRs that uh, went into Python. I mentioned verified cryptography. Uh, the specific library that uh, was uh, landed into Python is uh, HackleStar, the uh, verified uh, high assurance cryptographic library. And HackleStar is something that got integrated before in uh, Linux, Firefox, the, the, the Tezos blockchain. Um, but the novelty here is uh, the addition of these new APIs with the techniques that I just talked about and um, the fact that it went into Python. HackleStar is pretty large. My message is that it's a large amount of code and that productivity is really important because it's really hard to keep things together when you have 140,000 lines uh, of verified code and over 30 algorithms. So really, there's a lot of uh, attention and care that goes into uh, keeping everyone productive. HackleStar is written in the FSTAR programming language and compiles to about 80,000 lines of um, C code. And the reason we compile to C code is um, for performance there's a social thing wherein if you want people to take your code, you have to give them C, that's non-negotiable. Things are perhaps starting to change, but for people like Python or Mozilla or Linux, it is C code that has to be uh, produced. It's non-negotiable. And so it's a very unique set of constraints. We are producing, um, we are transpiling almost in a sense, code that people will actually look at because the workflow is as follows. If we want to say add a new algorithm like Kyber, like we're doing right now into Mozilla, we're going to produce the C code and we're going to submit a PR um, to the Mozilla repository, NSS, the uh, crypto library of Firefox. And then someone will look at the code. Someone will actually review the generated C code and will issue comments like you see on the right, like, should the code look like this? Should the code look like that? So there's a very strong constraint here, which is that what we produce is eminently readable. And uh, usually that involves a back and forth between us and whoever consumes our code downstream to reach a... Um, satisfactory state of affairs. And so the challenge for Python was the following. There was a pretty high level API for hash algorithms. Um, hash algorithms, you've heard about them. SHA-2, SHA-3, maybe you've heard about Blake 2 or you know that you shouldn't use MD5. Uh, Python has a built-in library that exposes those algorithms. And it turns out that they were gathering uh, different implementations from all over the place, uh, over the internet, and um, it was all doing the same stuff, but in a, like, there were five copies of the same API, five copies of the same state machine, uh, five copies doing pretty much the same thing. And when we set out to replace this stuff, of course we were not going to re-verify the same stuff uh, five times. We are uh, you know, part of a functional programming community and we try to uh, do things such as be generic. Uh, if there's the same stuff happening five times, you only want to write it once and you want to have aggressive code sharing and reuse. Um, you want to stay at a very high level. You want your invariants, your data types, you want to have higher order functions and polymorphism. And you want, of course, a lot of usability. You want your stuff to be as automated as possible. You want to 
your verification to go smoothly and you want, of course, to have abstraction. You don't want to hear about the gory, grotesque details of C code. You want to operate in like a very high level environment. And that's a challenge, right, when you're generating C code at the other end of the pipeline. And so this talk is really the story of how um, we managed to let the programmer, the person who writes the proofs, who proves all of these things, uh, think and operate at a very high level of abstraction, genericity, and modularity. Uh, and so the way we did it is that we essentially added a stage to the F star to C compilation pipeline that essentially implements something akin to C++ template specialization directly in F star in user land without extending the TCB. It turns out that it was a super useful feature that we ended up using all over the place in HackleStar. And I know for a fact that it made me and several of my collaborators much happier because we were able to get a very uh, high level of um, automation. So allow me now to um, give you a little bit of an intuition about how it works with just like drawings and then I'll get more into the um, technical details. Um, this is a static call graph. What this means is that the blue function at the top, update, is calling um, update 0 or 1 or update LT1 or update N. I'm not going to get into the details yet of what this update function does, but it's essentially the update function that um, the Python API needed, and there are subcases. So the blue box at the top calls into any of the three subcases below. And the blue code, and that's the important part, the blue code is entirely generic. It doesn't matter if this is the API for MD5 or the, MP, the API for SHA2 or any of the variants of SHA3. The blue code is identical. The blue code is really generic over the choice of the update block function that's underneath. And that one can be algorithm specific. There's an update function for SHA2, there's one for SHA3. There are a variety of update, of update functions, but the blue code really remains the same regardless of your choice of algorithm. And you can kind of see where this is going, right? Um, you want to write the generic code once, and you want to specialize it, you want to instantiate it, you want to apply your functor, whatever like, you, way you think of this, you want to specialize this code for uh, various choices of uh, block function. So for instance, you might want to get, you might want to have like this specialized for um, SHA-256, for instance. and if you remember, I said that we were producing C code and we have to produce idiomatic fast C code. And so that means that when you want to specialize your blue code over your choice of green box, you can do something like having function pointers or dynamic dispatch or having like a tag union or any of these things because the people who consume the code would be very unhappy. They would say that this is not idiomatic. That's not how you normally do it. It's slow. It's adding extra tests. And people will really get like hung up over one extra conditional in the critical path. So what you have to do actually is you have to get um, an entire copy of this whole static call graph and generate a specialized version of this entire thing for your choice of update block SHA-256. And you want to do it again. And for instance, you want to pick um, the SHA-512 function and you want to generate like an entire copy of this entire like, algorithm for SHA-512, et cetera, et cetera. And so that's essentially what we did in this work. We encoded that code specialization logic that copies an entire algorithm and produces a specialized version of it that um, is suitable for then feeding into the F star 2C uh, compilation pipeline. And this kind of code specialization is entirely written in F star without extending the TCB. It's a user land tactic that takes care of rewriting all of this code. As I mentioned before, one good intuition is that it's almost like C++ template specialization. The code is uh, copied. And of course, we verify the whole thing once, but we enjoy the specialization for free many times. And before I get into um, the details, I'll note that this is a recurring theme, actually, to um, have, of course, a high-level polymorphic construction that you want to specialize multiple times. We look at Rust. It's also polymorphic and is relying on whole program monomorphization um, um, to target LLVM bit code. Uh, Fiat Crypto also has like automated uh, verified compilation of high level specifications down to ASM and it's also giving you like a lot of specialization for free. Veil has verified transformations. All of these things are kind of operating in the same space. What is different for us is that we are generating C code that people will actually take a look at. And that puts a very unique set of constraints on the problem. Allow me now to um, 
jump into the technical details a little bit and give you an intuition of uh, what's happening. The language that we operate in is uh, called low star for low level F star. It's a subset of F star that compiles to C. It's a shallow embedding of um, curated C concepts in F star. It means that uh, you can use machine integers, you can use um, while loops, but you cannot use higher order, you cannot use closures, you cannot use any of these things because they don't naturally compile to C. Um, the code is irrelevant, it's a linked list, but uh, my point is, is that um, there's a fine function for that linked list and this implements a key value map uh, with a linked list of pairs where uh, the first element of the pair is a key and the second element of the pair is the value. Um, you have a null check here. Uh, we model the C memory model in F star and uh, the way that this operates is that if your code fits into the low star subset, then it's eligible for compilation to C via a dedicated compiler called Caramel um, that will generate C code out of this. And this is actually like verbatim what comes out of the compiler uh, on the right. So great, you can do things. You can do things like uh, a linked list but let's not, oh yeah, and like there's an erasure process that removes uh, ghost things. You can see here that your U32 on the left becomes a UN32T uh, from the intypes.h header on the right, et cetera. So low star in a nutshell is a low level subset of F star that models C concepts such as uh, the C memory stack and heap, machine integers, et cetera. And uh, Caramel compiles post erasure uh, low star to C. And we've used this for a variety of works, for the Noistar protocol compiler, for the Hackle uh, library in its various uh, iterations, for Quick, and so on. But if you look at the code that I just uh, introduced for uh, a warm-up, that code was very monomorphic, right? It was specialized for pairs of UN32s. The keys were UN32s and the values were UN32s. And so what if we want to go generic? Imagine that you want to have a version of the previous code that's higher order, that has generic type parameters, that is modular and well specified, well, you could do something like what you have on the right. You could um, define a type of maps that take a key and then give you a fine functions. You could define what it means to have uh, decidable equality with EQ type. It's a type T and a function that decides the equality of two T's and returns bool. And then you could say, okay, well, I have a map combinator that's gonna make a map given an EQ type and a choice of uh, types for the values. And um, you're super higher order and it's just really neat and you're generic and you also cannot compile to C because you cannot put a type in a record in C, you cannot use closures, you don't wanna use higher order and you don't wanna pass records around with function pointers in them. So you see the problem here, right? There's a tension between writing something that's super high level and yet generating um, readable C code. So there's a first idea that some of you might be thinking about. Uh, it's a good idea, but it doesn't scale. It's to inline. If I take the uh, example from the previous slide and kind of get the essence of it, right? There's a fine function that takes uh, a decidable equality type and a key, and that does, you know, uh, a review of all the entries in the map, and that calls e.eq, right? And that's the thing that's not C-like. You don't want to call, like, you, don't, you cannot select a function pointer and call it and like, have Mozilla be happy because you're passing around function pointers everywhere. So this is the thing that uh, is not really looking good. And for the sake of example, I've also added a send function. Let's imagine you're in a protocol and your send function takes a key and is looking up like the value associated to that key. Fine. A first idea is to aggressively inline everything. So imagine that you're trying to get a specialized version of the send function for you in 32. You could partially apply send to an EQ type where the type T is U32.T and the equality function is simply your equality monomorphically over 32-bit um, unsigned integers. And if you align on inlining, you will find that send U32 starts with the body of send then inlines fine, so you get the beginning of fine, and then you end up with a monomorphic equality test, and then the remainder of the inlining. And that is monomorphic, specialized, doesn't rely on function pointers or passing around records. And that would compile to C, great, but it would make people very unhappy because that doesn't scale. If you have more than a few functions, inlining everything will give you 2,000, 5,000 line C function bodies, and while for me, I'm like fine with it. The people who look at the C code are not fine with it and they will be like, quite upset if I give that to them. And, and here there's kind of a stumbling point, right? You can't use type classes or dictionaries. Uh, you don't want to pass closures around. It's not idiomatic. And even like 
truly generic code is very difficult in C because there's no top type. Um, the inlining idea from the previous slide doesn't scale either. Too aggressive, it's, it's unsightly, and that's where we're going to introduce a little uh, cocktail of techniques uh, with partial evaluation, metaprogramming, and a systematic code rewriting pattern. So what we do, and this is the gist of our technique, is that we introduce a systematic rewriting pattern. I'm going to demonstrate it manually, but in the following slide I will show how to automate it. So if I take the example on the left, this is exactly what we had on the previous slide with find, send, and send U32. Instead of doing inline, inline, I'm going to rewrite this into a higher order style. The find function is going to become parameterized over your choice of equality function. So MK find is a higher order function that receives an equality function. And here's the interesting bit. MK send is a higher order function that receives a specialized version of find for the particular value of E. The universal quantification over the EQ type is outside, which means that MK send first sets your EQ type, then receives a specialized version of find for that EQ type. And what that pattern allows us to do is to uh, instantiate in two steps. First, we generate a version of find that is specialized for u32.eq. And equipped with that specialized version of find, we generate a specialized version of send that refers to find u32. And that's the important bit. We're going to have a specialized copy of find, and send is going to call that specialized copy of find. And what this gives us is actually what we wanted. We get a specialized find u32. It calls the monomorphic u32 equality. And the send function is not aggressively inlined. It actually is specialized for u32 and calls the find u32 function. And that's the essence of our technique. With this, we manage to preserve the shape of the call graph. If I had find and send, I can specialize both find and send and give you a complete copy of the algorithm where every single function has its own specialized variant. That generates a very readable C code. Once again, it's kind of like template specialization in C++. I've generated a copy of the entire call graph, and this is a systematic pattern that can scale. And so the step two, of course, is to automate that pattern. So now we offer um, a micro DSL where the user can directly annotate uh, their code. So the user now writes the code on the left. The user doesn't have to write MK or something. All that the user uh, does is say, well, given an equality function, here's my find function written in natural style. Here's my send function that is going to refer to my find function. No particular encoding. The user annotates these three functions, saying that they all need to be specialized over their uh, respective choice of type argument. And then we have a meta program that runs at compile time that executes with an F star, inspects this code, entirely rewrites it, and produces the encoding that we just saw on the right. And so the user writes the code on the left. And then once the meta program has rewritten this entire call graph into the uh, higher order version on the right, all the user does is write the instantiations and the uh, specializations. And this is what I uh, refer to as an extra stage. We've essentially equipped F star with the ability to uh, rewrite your code to um, s allow you to specialize it for uh, a given uh, choice of uh, equality in this example. And then you can do that as many times as you want. You can do u64.eq, you can do any other type.eq, and you're going to get like, specialized copies of your code uh, for any choice of um, equality. It is sound. Uh, meta F star rechecks the terms that are generated, so uh, we don't have to worry about um, the, um, an implementation mistake in the rewriting tactic. And it traverses the entire call graph, and it um, allows the user to not have to think about the encoding. We have more bells and whistles. Uh, we can emulate Cox section variables without extending F stars. There's another little facility where you can say, well, this function is just a helper, so that one can be inlined away. It doesn't need to appear as a specialized copy and all like a few more gadgets. But the bottom line is that this has turned out to be extremely useful in Star. So moving away from that little micro example with uh, send and find, what have we been using this for in the real world? Well, first of all, and before I get to the Python use case, first of all, we've been using it for um, a lot of algorithms in uh, HackleStar. The V2 of HackleStar, called HackleXN, leverages uh, SIMD instructions in uh, processors. And so oftentimes, we write an entire algorithm that is completely generic over the um, 
level of uh, vectorization. So that means that almost all of the code is the same, so it's parametric, it's polymorphic over a data type that's either uh, plain C, 128 bit, uh, yeah, 128 bit uh, vectorized uh, instructions like AVX or NEON or 256 bit like AVX2. And um, this is great, we can write the algorithm once, rely on the tactic and gen generate three copies of the same algorithm for uh, these three vectorization levels. This is an actual screenshot of how it looks like. Um, splice means insert into the scope the definitions that are produced by the tactic. And then what the user writes is give me a specialized AAD decrypt for a uh, given a specialized cha-cha encrypt and a specialized poly encrypt. We have other um, uses for this in HackleStar. We have notably uh, HPKE, which is a very fun algorithm that combines under the hood uh, three sub algorithms. And so we can write one HPKE and then generate uh, 15 or more if we'd like. There are at least 80 possible options. We can generate like copies of HPKE specialized for a given uh, suffer suite, so a given choice of uh, GH, uh, key derivation, and the signature. Curve uh, 25519 is also a, a fun example. You can choose first whether you want your core field operations to be in assembly or in C, and then you get a field, and then you can choose again and generate multiple copies given your underlying uh, base field. Which brings me to perhaps the flagship application. These are um, already uses of the techniques that I described, but the flagship use of the technique that I described is the streaming API, and that's the stuff that went into Python. So now I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that whole like update business. This is a very nasty state machine. Um, this is a state machine for what's called a block algorithm. A block algorithm means that it processes data uh, block by block. A block is, I don't know, 128 bytes, 64 bytes, whatever, but it can only process data one block at a time. And this means that the state machine is super tricky. Um, you must feed the data block by block, which is not realistic for most use cases, because you don't always have like an amount of data coming in that you want to hash that's to a multiple of the block size. Um, it's also a nasty state machine because if you want to compute the hash, the digest, uh, you kill your state. Your state becomes invalid. And so oftentimes you want to compute intermediary hashes as the data comes in, and that requires great care. And there's like a precise sequence of operations to obey. And so no one uses that, right? No one uses uh, that block uh, API. What everyone uses is called a uh, streaming API, which has the beautiful state machine uh, up on the top right, and it, the uh, streaming API takes care of the buffering. The streaming API maintains a little internal buffer that fills up, and then when it's full, it flushes it into the underlying hash algorithm. And it takes care of all of the internal details. Um, it uh, doesn't invalidate the state when you extract a digest, and so this is what you want to deal with as a client. If you're Python, that's the API that you're actually using. Uh, but, well, the reason we're here is that this API is uh, very tricky to implement correctly. So um, there has been a very fun series of uh, papers that have found um, bugs in this very uh, streaming layer for reference implementations, uh, notably of the SHA-3 uh, hashing algorithms. And because Python maintains in its source repository a copy of this uh, reference implementation of SHA-3, Python inherited the SHA-3 bug and uh, ended up with a CVE. And that's where we came in. So uh, we got in touch with the Python folks who were super nice. And uh, they were very uh, on board with the idea of replacing their buggy algorithms with a uh, verified version of it. So we were able to write uh, the streaming API using the style that I described. Uh, we wrote it once, we verified it once, but then we used those techniques to specialize it for uh, about 15 applications. Uh, Python took a large amount of those and uh, that gave us enormous code savings. Uh, it would have been absolutely impossible to verify streaming APIs for each one of the uh, hash algorithms that we have. And so uh, this technique of writing the streaming API once and specializing it multiple times for SHA-2, in four variants, SHA-3, six variants, MD5, SHA-1 for legacy, etc., that gave us like, a huge boost in productivity and that actually led us to a proof to code ratio of 0 0.51, uh, which means that every line of F star yields two lines of C code. That metric has its limits. The reason I'm mentioning it is that we've been using that metric in previous papers and we never attained such like a low ratio. So that means that it's a massive improvement in productivity compared to earlier versions of Hagglestar. We've had an excellent engagement with the Python team. We replaced all of their built-in uh, 
hash implementations except for Blake 2, which will happen soon. And it's a good confirmation uh, that our work had practical impact. Um, it forced us to uh, polish a lot of what we did and uh, do some serious packaging work, but uh, it's good because our code is better off for it now. And uh, that's about it. The lessons that I want to like, uh, leave you with is that the arsenal of PL techniques uh, allowed us to get the best of both worlds, operate at a very high level while still generating very low level, very specialized code. We have essentially an extra compiler stage that implements something like C++ template specialization. This found a lot of applications within Hypolstar and our flagship application was the streaming API that transforms the unsafe state machine into a safe one and that one was integrated into Python. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Yes. Uh, please line up for questions. And uh, please uh, introduce yourself with um, your name and affiliation. And please eat the mic. Mm. Well, close to the mic, well, as close as possible. Can Thank I you. see the nutrition facts first? <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Hello, this is Adam Tapala from MIT. You mentioned how you don't have to trust your rewriting process because the results of it are rechecked. Mm -hmm. That sounds like you could have some downsides, like presumably that would mean you don't actually know that all the instantiations of each abstraction are correct unless you've tried all of them and it might actually be more expensive to check the specialized versions than the original one. Is that all uh, fair so far? It's the elaborator reflection design, right? That uh, the compiler exposes a safe API to you that doesn't allow you to create um, anything that would end up being accepted as an invalid uh, ill-typed term. Um, there are no facilities currently in FSTAR that would allow you to show once and for all that the rewriting uh, tactic always produces well-typed terms. Mm. In practice, uh, the transformation is uh, pretty systematic and explains itself rather well. And so once we debugged it, this was like three or three years ago, we haven't had any issues since. But in a security context like this, you can imagine someone purposely choosing a weird set of parameters where they'd noticed a corner case in your, your rewriter and maybe they would be able to get around a supposed proof that had already been constructed. Where I guess compilation would fail, which would be a little surprising. You wouldn't deploy that code. But nonetheless, there might have been a bug lurking in there. Is that right? I'm having a hard time imagining something like that happening. But let's okay. check more afterwards. OK, thanks. Hello, I'm Hello. Max Vanema, undergrad at UIEC. I'm wondering um, how Hacklestar deals with like timing attacks or like, other kinds of side tunnel attacks. Is that out of scope? Sorry, deals with what? How does Hacklestar deal with like timing attacks or timing attacks. other kind of side channel attacks? Yes, so uh, there's a type-based discipline in which uh, secret data doesn't enjoy the operations that the rest of the data has, like division. And secret data is a distinct abstract type, so you can't use it for memory accesses or uh, branching. And so that rules out uh, the most standard classes of side channel attacks. And that's the discipline that we use throughout. Even with like specialization, the like, different vectorization primi primitives? Yeah, it? the specialization still um, doesn't traverse the abstraction boundaries, so it won't look underneath. So there's a different flavor of integer that I didn't show here called secret integer, S32.t, and the specialization will not, uh, it can't actually, it can't look underneath the S32.t abstraction, so um, you still, um, the guarantees are preserved after specialization. It's a typing guarantee because the specialized code still type checks, and it means that it still enjoys that uh, degree of side channel resistance. Okay, great, thank you. Thanks. And yes, and there is actually um, a similar question by Edwin Turek uh, from Zen Server on, online. So if you implement RSA, for instance, can you require that something equivalent to RSA, uh, RSA blinding is used? Uh, Array what? RSA blinding. Uh, RSA blinding, yeah, so on, t on, on top of that, we, um, like we have a, a set of library functions that uh, you have to go through if you want to do certain things, such as like masking equality functions uh, and the like. I don't know about RSA blinding specifically, but we uh, oftentimes do, uh, do impose uh, these restrictions. And this is our last question for this. Uh, oh, thank talk. you. Uh, Ryan Steele, CMU. Uh, I have a quick question about other applications. This seems very um, in line with something along the lines of um, uh, neural network uh, uh, performance kernel implementation. Have you actually looked at that kind of application? 
Uh, we have not, but we uh, welcome uh, new uh, contributors to HackleStar. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you, Jonathan. And Thanks. thank you. Thank you again.